My name is Ian Harrower, and music has been a part of my life ever since I can remember. I cut hair to make ends meet, and I'm looking for a change. So I'm taking my vintage Triumph motorcycle, and I'm leaving my job, my home, and my girl to take a journey across the U.S. to explore music. So follow me through big cities and small towns of all kinds, talking, listening, and learning about the music that defines and tells the stories of the people in the city they live in. So come with me, down the highway. I'm heading down to Orange County, California, where I grew up, to meet with Exine Cervanka, a living rock and roll and punk legend. Exine is the singer for one of LA's pioneering punk bands, X. Exine's had a long and full career with the bands X, The Knitters, as well as several solo and side projects. I'm very excited to talk with Exine about music, life, and whatever else comes up. With Exine Cervanka, rock and roll and punk rock legend. You were an ex, the knit, well, you still are an ex, yeah. the knitters. Uh, there was Antichrist, the original Sinners, mm -hmm. and now uh, just Exine Cervanka. Yeah, correct? Well, yeah, I'm always me too. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> but yeah, I do a lot of uh, like just, you know, spoken, I wouldn't call it spoken word, I'd call it talking. Okay. It's like the best way to tour. It's like it's hard to tour with a band nowadays. But, you know, X and the Knitters can go on the road. But I tried to figure out what can you do where you don't have to worry about a lot of equipment. Well, just go and talk. You don't have to bring paper. Just go and just, yeah. just so let I do it, that. Let I do it out. So I do everything from talking to playing guitar and singing to X, yeah, still. Okay, so now under X and Cervanka, there's a full album. There's four now just yeah. under your name. Do you ever tour under your own name with a yeah, full band? I, uh, well, no. Okay. You can't anymore. Okay. It's, it's too impossible. Gas is too expensive. It's too expensive. People can't go out. They don't want to hire a babysitter. They don't want to go out at 11 o'clock at night. Nobody's got any money. And um, so I don't even es expect that from people. That's why I do this, the, the spoken word of the guitar thing. Because right. I'm like, last year I did a tour for Record Store Day. And um, instead of just playing on Record Store Day, I played the whole month of April in record stores for free up the West Coast. So I played like 21 shows. Wow. And I had way more people at those shows. If you play at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and it's in a town and everybody can bring their kids and it's free and, and it's fun, you'll get two, 300 people. And the thing is, then they all shop at the store, they buy your new record and the store makes some money and you have a good time and maybe you sell some t-shirts, you get your gas, your hotel paid for it, and you go to the next town. And it, that was the, one of the best tours I ever did. That's really smart. That's a really smart idea. You know, and, and it helps everybody. Everybody's sure. happy in the end. So, you know, I should be a diplomat. Yeah, <laughs> you should. <laughs> so now, so then, so obviously X and the Knitters will still play as full outfits yeah. when you go mm -hmm. out and do the tours. Oh, yeah, always. But any other ones. So are you still doing Original Sinners at all, no. ever? No. No. So all those mm -hmm. are just recorded projects Yeah, now those and... were just recording. You know, those those didn't really go anywhere fundamentally, so, you know. Will you still play some of those songs no. by yourself? No. No. Mm -mm. So all, all I always new play stuff. one new stuff. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, now let's back it up to um, I guess probably the X days. And can you describe to me what it felt like when you first heard yourself on the radio? Um, I don't know when I heard myself on the radio. Um, I don't remember that moment, but um, I do remember. Um, playing Los Angeles for the first time for Friends. And Kickboy Face from Slash Magazine, um, Claude Bessie was there, and Chris D from the Flesh Eaters, and a, a few other people, and me and John. And um, I was so excited, I wanted them to hear the record. And then the second the needle went down, I went, oh no, they're gonna hear the record. What if they don't like it? And I swear <laughs> that was the first time I really felt like that was even a possibility, because I wasn't even judging, you know? I was right. just making a record, you know? You know, it's really funny is I, Actually, that's what I remember the first time, too, was the first record I ever made when the needle first touched down. Yeah. That's, I remember that moment. I remember where I was. So that actually would be a better, the better yes. question to ask is where well, were you when the needle first touched down? Needle, where were you when the needle touched down? <laughs> yeah. um, 
But, you know, um, the X days were, the early punk days were um, pretty indescribable, pretty phenomenal. You know, yeah. uh, very not not known, really. There's a very big misconception about the early punk days and um, about what it was about, who was part of it, what it sounded like, what it looked like. All that stuff's kind of been trampled because the early punk days are, are 75 to 80. Right. You know, that's when it was the punk days. And then the I always think of the hardcore scene as kind of overlapping into that and, and kind of taking over the punk mantle. And then that original punk just kind of got forgotten about. Do you think a lot of the like the earlier 80s bands, like 82, 83, 84, those eras. I mean, would you even consider that post-punk at that time? Which bands, then? for instance? Well, I mean, like a lot of the L.A. and Orange County bands, you know, like in the early 80s, we had, you know, TSOL and Adolescence and Social Distortion, and those kind of bands come out of uh, Orange County. And then Ooh. L.A. bands like your band, X, and of course, you know... Uh, Plugs and all that. All those bands were also right. playing through that era, but was that almost... was that? No, those were just like the kids coming up. Okay. Into the scene, you know, which right. is really good. Lifeblood, you know, you want the kids coming up into the scene. So they're scene, still right? growing, you think, at yeah, that yeah. time? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. I think that, that, was, that was, the, those were the kids that came to the shows, and as soon as they could, they started bands, you know. Right. Um, that was the point. Sure. You know, was to spawn that, um, which is one of the reasons why um, this nation changed all the drinking ages in every state to 21. Because from 18 to 21, boy, you know, you're either going to college or you're trying to figure out what you're going to do with your life or right. maybe you're going to go into the military. You go to a show, a punk rock show, you're going to be changed forever. That's it. You're going to, you're going to make a whole different decision tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. And when they changed that drinking age to 21, it wiped out the college crowd. It wiped out all the, like, seeker kids, you know, the confused kids, the kids looking for something, the kids with no place to go. And it just told them, no, you cannot experience this. And that's why they changed the drinking age to 21 on positive, because um, otherwise you'd have to believe that they cared about our safety. <laughs> and, right. you know, I mean, you, you can't, you know, make that choice. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's interesting because, you know, a lot of people tried to make all ages clubs at that point as well. And, and people were successful at it. But the thing I noticed, especially when I was young and playing in punk bands when I was 14 and 15, is that the club would be there for two or three months or four months and it would be gone. Then another club would open up and all-ages club would be there for two or three, four months and then be gone. I, it, I, and what I started learning is that the insurance, carrying the insurance on a club like that with having minors in the building oh, past 10 p.m., right, and stuff like that became really difficult. So you right. were talking about that drinking age being raised at 21. Now there was an insurance problem that kept people... Uh, unable to keep doors open to clubs because of how much it costs to keep carry those insurances. Um, right. Small clubs that were charging three bucks for and people the, to come in and not selling alcohol. And you the, know? the only bands that could really do that were like four guys in a van that didn't have to stay anywhere except on a floor. If you had any requirements past that, it was pretty hard to make to do that circuit. Right. Because I've been in and out of that circuit too. And, um, you know, it's it's pretty hard, you know. You play a show and ask if anybody has any room where, where you can stay, you know, that's for five I, people, you know. I've toured. That's, that's, that's all my tours. But you know, time. we all manage, right? We it it you know, punk started before the internet and before cell phones and before you know, video. Really, I mean, just when video was like still giant cameras and you know everything was film. I mean, and we we fucking exploded that, you know, out and sure. to the world and. So now it should be easy for people that are young to um, spread the messages like that, you know. It is a bit easier, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and it's interesting what you said, how a lot of people have a misconception about what the punk scene was like when you guys were, when it was starting in, yeah. in the mid 70s. Because the younger generation only has really documentaries to watch about it. And there's mm -hmm. photographs and there's some moving images. Uh, and they're talking to people that were there. They're talking to some of the bands that were right. there. But I think everybody has their own interpretation and their own story to go with it. So you're, I can see how the idea may have been, you know, has gotten diluted well, yeah, along and, the yes, way. And you or, know why? The original punk scene wasn't as sensational as like the hardcore scene. Um, if you were wearing a vintage dress and, and cowboy, like just like I'm dressed now, right? 
and you were walking around, people would make fun of you, but they couldn't really label you as much, and they didn't like you, or your hair was messy, they would throw something at you. But it was mostly like an intellectual, artistic, musical, social, revolution, political, anti-corporate culture scene. Right. And it wasn't um, until the hardcore thing came along, the timing was right because then people had caught up, oh, this thing is happening, and the technology had caught up a little bit. More people were drawn into punk by then than they were in the, you know, because they'd heard about it and they wanted to cover it. And then that was like so theatrical. Right. You know, it was always like, you know, 300 people on stage jumping off the speakers and riots and, <laughs> you know, really forceful guys just like singing and forceful guys in the audience with their shirts off. And, you know, it drew it drew the media's interest where a quiet, you know, more contemplative version of that wouldn't. Not that we weren't all very powerful and very scary. Right. And, and threatening. I know we were. But <laughs> we did it in a way that wasn't... Um, you know, I don't want to use the word, I, I don't know what the word is, it's just two different worlds, you know? Sure. And there was a lot of media attention at one, or media attention, I should say, at one point back then. I mean, obviously with a lot of the, the British punk, too, you know, they tried to put, you know, a lot of these bands on big record labels and put them on talk shows. Right. They thought it was going to be the new thing, so there was an instant media uh, attention, but I don't think anybody really could figure out quite what was happening out of that mm -mm. whole cluster of bands yet yeah in fact when i was on american bandstand one time dick clark asked, said to me can i ask you a question i said sure he <laughs> said you know in the 50s when rock and roll started you know i had all these great people on the show and he was like named like little richard and all these people Chuck, you know Chuck Berry, jerry lewis and then he goes and then in the 60s you know jefferson airplane or whoever it was that was on his show right like, you know, the Beatles or whatever. I don't know who was on Was the this show. on camera that he was no, asking No, no, no. He okay. was asking me in, in the back before we went on the show. And he goes, um, and so then the 60s happened and then all those people came in. And now it's, you know, the punk thing is happening and why isn't it on the radio? Why, why, why won't anyone, why isn't it like, like the 60s and the 50s? Wow. And that was my question that I would ask him, being Dick Clark. Perhaps, sure. What do you think is going on? And I just thought, oh no, no, we're all just screwed because because Dick Clark know, doesn't even know. <laughs> he can't, you know, he's, he's in, you know, he he knows something wrong, but he can't put his finger on it. And so I just said, well, if you don't know, then I don't know. I I don't know, but now I do know. Sure. So I do know what's going on. Is um, it's my belief that after Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, and Jim Morrison died, and um, after the end of the Vietnam War and all that. Uh, and then music became kind of softer. Mm -hmm. uh, the edge was taken off, like, you know, because that's what happens. You know, things start out and they just go gangbusters and then they kind of soften the edges and it gets more and more watered down and more duplicated and more third, fourth, fifth generational. Right. But um, after those guys all died, because I was around then, I was very young, but um, it was a super shock and everybody was blown back by that, you know, that whole movement. And it was already kind of becoming commercialized and everything. But what had happened was that was the music that was on the radio. And when they all died and the music, um, then punk came along, there was already a, a certain group of people that had started in college in FM radio who were pretty powerful, like in, in Chicago WCFL. You know, you had famous DJs then. You right, know? yeah, right. And you had, you know, and that, that music was going strong. And then we went, no, we want to replace it with this new music. And they went, no, you're not. We're going to make classic rock out of this. We're never going to let you in. And that's what happened. And there was no place for it because everyone was playing the music that wouldn't die. The music that they loved, they wouldn't let go of. It was a trauma. You know, if those, if those people hadn't died, maybe things would have been different. I don't know. But I remember the trauma of that. Um, but, you know, so there was no room. They, they just refused to let us on. Just refused. That's amazing, and, and 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 yeah, and I guess everybody would have their own opinion, I guess, about why it didn't happen like it should have. But you know, your take on it's very interesting. I never thought of it that way. Well, you know, that is part of it. I don't know that that I wouldn't say that's the whole sole reason. You know, I mean, some of it had to do with just like how how weird the music was. You know, but um, you know, I mean, listen, you know, the Eagles and Linda Ronstadt. We've talked about this a million times. Fleetwood Mac. That was what was on the radio. That was California music. Right. Then we come out, you know, on Sunset Boulevard, you know, 
you know, out of Hollywood Boulevard and and confront that straight like head on. night and day between and, and, the two. And start confronting it and yeah. call it out and just start attacking it. Right. Of course they're not going to put us on the radio. Here's Fleetwood Mac and then here's X, you yeah. know. And, you know, and also back then it was the big gravy train, you know. There was, you know, payola and drugs and limousines and sex and everybody had big, huge recording budgets and there was money everywhere and... You know, it was like cocaine central, you know. And, and so, you know, the industry was, was really spoiled. They just had so much money then. And um, so the, the stars and the people that support the star system were all very happy with what was going on. And why, why bring in a bunch of punks to say this is terrible, you know? No one's going to do that. Yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, from, from a, I guess from a kind of a big record label, almost corporate financial standpoint, well, I can I see that. I can see that yeah. being a big part of it. That was also like, but that's also like, that was also like a choice that people could make. Now that doesn't happen because the corporations are so tightly in control of every aspect of our lives, especially the media and the corporate culture, that we wouldn't be allowed in now for a totally different reason, which would be censorship. Right. So now there is no money. And there is no inroad into the corporate culture. There is no door in anymore for anybody unless you play the game like so strictly along their their rules. I mean, you have to be totally in on, on that. Oh, yeah, sure. Of to course. Exist. So, but I, I, you know, I like it right now as far as um, what pe young people are doing and, and old people, everybody. They're getting creative because when, when things are bad, people get hopeless and they kind of get depressed. But when things are hopeless, you know, and, and there, there really is no solution, black humor comes out, creativity comes out. Sure. Like in times of trouble where you're famine or something, it's like, well, guess what I learned how to make? You know, shoe leather soup. Ha, 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 yeah, you know? I was going to get water out of this rock, you, you know? know. But, you know, I mean, no, people get really creative and they come together and they unite when things get tough. And no one's going to let, you know, American music die ever. So, no, of course you know, not. it will keep resurfacing in new ways. And that's what I think is interesting about where the music industry and music in general has ended up at this moment. Uh, you know, the, the, the days you were talking about where it was just money and just drugs yeah. and just got so bloated. Yeah. That popped, you know, and then it popped when there was a lot more talent and a lot more people able to learn instruments and make bands and play music. And so now everybody is coming up out of that era in a new era where there isn't that kind of attainable... Right. Money anymore, unless you're really the top pop thing, you know. So I feel like it's making for a lot better music being made and better bands and just better artists in general, whether you're like, you know, a singer songwriter or a full outfit of four or five people. There's just people spending a lot more time on quality now versus quantity. So I think it's kind of good that that happened in the music industry, you know, I mean, corporate America, whatever, there's, you know, but in, in, in corporate music, I'm glad it blew up when it did, like uh, exploded yeah. when it did, and then we had a chance to sort of rebuild, right. you know. Well, it's like how it used to be, you know, when, when, you know, baseball players, you know, country singers, poets, when the, you know, poets didn't used to think, well, I'm going to be a big poet someday and have a big house in Beverly Hills. Or, you know, and, and, you know, neither did singers or baseball players. You know, it's just if you were good at something, you did it. If you weren't good, you didn't. Yeah, you got paid to do a job that you were good at. Yeah. And then and some of them just got exploited, unfortunately. But, you know, of course, and so there's a balance between those two realities. But, um, yeah, the, if there's no temptation to sell out, you're not going to sell out, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, now, that you mentioned Jimi Hendrix mm -hmm. and Janis Joplin and Jim Morrison and all, all of those people earlier. Uh which kind of brings me to a question I wanted to ask you. Before you were a musician, before you had any bands, was there a song? Do you remember hearing a song or an artist somewhere along the way that really pushed you toward wanting to do this for a living no. and make music? There isn't one... No, that wasn't... The, but I'll, I'll tell you, that's a, that's a no-yes answer. When I was, um, let's see, 13... I was, uh, I loved, um, I heard the song Light My Fire on the radio, mm -hmm. and um, the, that was back when the radio played different kinds of music, you know. I lived outside of Chicago, but we could get the, you know, you know, the Midwest, you can get like radio far away. And um, it was my favorite song, and I loved it. And one day, I was driving down the road with my parents, and they were in the front seat, and I was in the back, and that song came on. 
And my mom and dad knew I liked it, and so they kind of turned, you know, they didn't blast it or anything, but, you know, it's an old car radio, 63 car, probably. Right. right. One so they speaker. Turned, they turned it up a little bit, right? And I was just sitting there grooving to light my fire because I just loved it, and it went into the long version, which I had never heard. And by the time that song was over, I was a transformed person. And then for Christmas, my mom got me that record. That really was a, the big musical point in my life, where I got it. And so perhaps that's what makes me play music now, but that's not what made me play music in 76. Oh, right. I see. So perhaps that's... That was a turning point for, for what music meant to mm -hmm. you at... Yeah, absolutely. I'd never connected it, you know, like, wow, you know, I want to play music now. It was never like that. Well, I, I didn't ever want to play music. I, I just fell into it, so... I think it happens with quite a few people, and actually some of the best stuff I know is born out of just that, an accident, you know, yeah. somebody didn't plan on. Now, so right. so what made you, what pushed you to, to do it in 76? I mean, was it really just in a circumstance or a coincidental thing, or you had, at that moment, had a, like a, a moment of clarity where you're like, this is what I want I to didn't do want with anything. my friends? I didn't want anything. I didn't want to be anything. I didn't want to do anything. I just, I wanted to just exist as a, you know, free spirit kind of, but... What I found out was um, I came to California with no money. I was sleeping in someone's kitchen, five people in a one bed, one room house, apartment. And um, I got a job through, Jerry Brown was governor and he had this program for women. If you had no education, no job skills, and you were like basically homeless, you could get in this job program and they would train you pay you minimum wage while you're trained and learned a skill. Okay. And then they would place you in a nonprofit for like three months and then you could conceivably go find a job after that. Right. It was a great program. But they put me at Beyond Baroque, which was the biggest literary poetry epicenter of California besides Verlinghetti, you know, the bookstore in San Francisco, you know. So I moved into the apartment upstairs from where I worked as a typesetter. And I had underneath me a meeting room and every night there'd be meetings and I'd hear this meeting room and I'd hear people singing happy birthday and all these people talking. I'd never been to an AA. I didn't even know what AA was. Okay. So I was like, what is this, a cult, you know? Yeah. I would hear this like, these people going, um, 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 all together. And they were saying the Lord's person, but I was like, what are they saying? They're all chanting. And then they'd sing happy birthday every, every time and I'd be like, what are they doing down there? Is it a birthday cult? And then um, I found out, of course, that there was a poetry workshop down there. Okay. And so I went down to that. And it was the night John went, John Doe from X. And um, he sat next to me and we chatted and we hung out. And he told me about the punk scene that was happening. And he had a car and I didn't. And it was all in Hollywood and I was in Venice. So he took me to the mask. And I met Billy. And then, um, because he'd already met Billy. Um, and that is the way that happened. So, yeah, that really wasn't planned out at all. That was very circumstantial. Well, I, wrote, I was writing poetry, and John told me he was playing music with Billy and that some of my words were really good. Could he use them in a song? And I said, no. <laughs> no, absolutely not. What do you mean? He goes, well, I have this band. I want to start with that back. Billy, you know, and I, yeah. we're looking for a drummer, and I really like this song you wrote, I'm Coming Over, and I want to put music to it. And I go, I have music for it. He goes, no, you have a melody. I go, no, I have music. He goes, well, do you play an instrument? I'm like, no. And he goes, well, that's the music. What you do when you sing is the melody. I go, well, I have the words and the melody, so that's two out of three. So, you know, I'm, I'm keeping my song. He goes, all right, well, why don't you come sing it then? I go, all right, I will. You know, so you guys I, were yes, challenging each other. I could see them. I could see you guys sitting in the car. You know, he's dropping you off at the house. You're going back and forth about this. Yeah, you <laughs> know, I mean, fine. Was, I'll show up then. It was. It wasn't. <laughs> you know, it was a little contentious because it was all I had in the world was my words. I had no money. I barely had a place to live. I had a job that was going to end in a month or two, and then what was I going to do? I didn't have like a boyfriend or anybody to take care of me. I never really have had people take care of me. You know? Right. And so. Um, you know, I was pretty guarded about my stuff, you know, and, um, you know, then I had to get used to the idea that I was suddenly going to sing in a band, which I'd never done before. X is my first band, you know, but they'd all been in a million bands, so, um, 
my experience was completely different from and, theirs. And that could be and that could be intimidating too, walking in with a bunch of people that already have done this and you've you never kidding? done it before, you know. <clears throat> you don't think Billy Zoom was intimidating seventy yeah, six yeah. man? <laughs> he is the most intimidating person in the world. I've heard I've heard things. I don't know for sure, but I've And heard he's things. the sweetest person and he's great, but he's he's enigmatic, he's eccentric, he's a genius, he's funny, he's the funniest person I've ever met. He's the best sense of humor of anyone I've ever met. He should be a, a stand up because his humor is, is unbelievable. <laughs> um, he's great, but uh, yeah, intimidating. But, but in serious about them. music, I'm sure, very serious oh, yeah. about well, I mean, they're all really, really, really good, so yeah. I just walked in there, never had a song before, you know, it's like, whatever, whatever, you know, figure it out. Yeah. And I figured it out. That's what, that's all you can do. Yeah. Now, we were talking about uh, The Doors earlier and how Light My Fire was one of those songs that could have quite possibly changed your life, mm -hmm. for, you know. What's really interesting about that is fast forward back down to X, you know, coming together, and now you guys ended up working with Ray Manzarek. I know, it's weird. Which is amazing. See, that's, I thought that was amazing in general, but now that you tell that story about hearing Light My Fire. Well, let me tell you this. So I hear that song on the radio, and I really become transformed. Then I get it for Christmas, and then I'm just like the biggest Doors fan in the world in my little town of a thousand people. And, um, then of course Jim Morrison dies of a heart attack, allegedly, and then, <laughs> and then um, life goes on, you know. And then one day I moved to Venice, California, just out of nowhere else to go, out of desperation to get out of Florida, and start to realize that the Doors were kind of there was a center there of the Doors, and I got all the Doors records used, and I had a record player, and I would just play them over and over. And I loved them so much, and then I really got into California because of that, mm -hmm. and the fog, and Venice, and the war. The war was ending, and people were still coming, you know, just reintegrating back into society. Seventy-six, and then um, here comes Ray Manzarek. So it was. It's pretty weird, you know. And he produced our, our first four records. So and isn't that? It's. I mean, it's. It, it's almost like that whole. <laughs> That whole story was all pieces that were supposed to come together to make that happen, I, I guess. I mean, it's just, it's too, it's too bizarre how that worked out. It's synchronous. Like, out of anybody. It could have been somebody else. It could have been, you know what I mean? It could have been like, you could have met Eric Clapton. He's like, I yeah. love you guys. I'm going to produce you guys. Cool. Eric Clapton's producing us. This is great. But it had to be Ray Manzarek from the band that you loved that it really changed your life when you were young. Yeah, it's, it's very weird. Very interesting. So now when it comes to songwriting... Mm -hmm. What's your process? Do you write about things that are happening right now? Do you write about things that are happening in the past? Do you just make some stuff up? I mean, what's, do you have a process? Mm -hmm. Well, I did spend a couple years writing love songs exclusively. Um, and that was, you know, my, my experiences, other people's experiences, the past, the future, the present. But right now, I, um, I mo mostly write... Um, Kind of old, well, I, I've always written kind of old-fashioned, like, you mm -hmm. know, but right now I'm writing, like, really old-fashioned gospel-y. That's cool. And um, old-fashioned um, protest. Interesting. And also, I wrote some um, anti-Illuminati hip-hop songs. Yeah. <laughs> and um, one is called Echo en Chino, which means made in China in Spanish. And it's about the Russian 98 cent store with everything made in China for Mexican choppers. And how... Um, Say that 10 buy, times fast. Don't, don't buy it anymore. And it's... it's it's. I made a... Um, so I made like this hip hop... Uh, it's like a hip hop song. And my friend in on the East Coast, who's in this really great um, instrumental band, the Cosmonauts, played a ba made a, the bass track for all these songs. And then I'm going to have a drummer. And so we, we start out with the bass track and words, and then I'll make the, the kind of cadence and then... So that that's something I want to do. So I'm working on that. I that's, forgot about that. But it's actually probably the last thing I would have expected to hear from you. Well, it's going to be. Song, it's you know? not going to be like you know. I'm not going to be trying to pretend to be like a guy singing a hip hop song. I'm going to um, you use that as a starting place to make my version. You know. Sure. Well. So here here's something I, I wanted to talk about also, um, which could very well lend to what we're talking about is um, not too far back you were diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Oh yeah, let me just head that off at the pass. 
about 16 years ago, I got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and then I went to another doctor who said, no, you don't have that. Okay. So I went, great, I don't have it, ha, ha, ha. And then about five years later, I had some other weird stuff happen, and then I went back and had to get like more tests done and you know MRIs and all that. And the doctor said, I think you got multiple sclerosis, but I'm not sure. So I went to another doctor, and he said, no, I don't think you do. So this went on and on. I'm and exhausted then, just hearing I that know, much. I know. It's the medical, you know, practicing medicine, right? Yeah. So I go to Missouri, and I go to the doctor, and he says, you got it, you got it. I'm sure you got it. And, you know, take this medicine every day and inject yourself with this medicine every day. And so I do that for a while, and then I, I don't have any insurance, so I can't do it anymore because the medicine's $7,000 for every three months. So I, I go, well, you know what? I don't have it again. You know what I mean? Ugh. I just, just I don't know. Do I? Do I? So I go to this new doctor, and he did the same thing. You do, you don't, you do, you don't. And now I'm seeing another doctor, and he says I don't. So um, what I found out, which is really interesting through this public statement about it, is there's a lot of women, most of them younger than me by far, who are having mystery neurological ailments that can't be diagnosed and are being misdiagnosed with fibromyalgia and MS and lupus and they don't know and Epstein-Barr and maybe it's this and maybe no, now it's that. Now a lot of people I met have been diagnosed with MS and they have real uh, tangible uh, hardcore symptoms and hardcore test results but not everybody with MS has either of those things. Like not so obvious, yeah. yeah. So you don't know if you have it or not. You can't really diagnose it. That's why they keep saying you have it, you don't, you have it, you don't. But I do have m m you know, weird mystery ailments. So as of this moment, there is not a definite diagnosis. No. Well, that's, I mean, that's great to hear that Well, what concerns me is not, is not that. Because coming out with that thing, that I said that, changed my life forever because it gave me like this whole different view of humanity and how good and caring and loving people are because the way people if rushed to give me help with that, uh, strangers and fans and people uh, sending me books in the mail or, or meeting me at the show, you know, in a wheelchair to say thank you for saying you have MS and this is a doctor that you should find out about and I made you this necklace, you know, things like that, wow. you know. People are just so good, you know. So that was okay. That that sustained me when I was sick and when I was having um, medicine and, and not knowing what, really what was going on. But the bigger picture is what is wrong with people that we can't find out what's wrong with them? Why don't we have care for people so we can find out what's wrong with them? Why wasn't I able to take medicine for my illness? And how do we find out what's causing these mystery ailments? Yeah. There's a breast cancer epidemic as well, you know, but I mean, in young women, young women. Sure. But this is like fishy, you know. There's something environmentally, probably the chemtrails, you know, with the alumina and the barium and the and the strontium that comes down out of the sky, if that's what that is, we don't really know. But um, definitely they're poisoning us, you know. This is, you know, find somebody who doesn't believe that, you know. Well, yeah, there's a lot of people who, who would choose to not believe it, even though they know somewhere in the corner of their mind there is something going on. And I, I kind of want to bring this back to music because everything you just said is very intense and, and stuff and very, I mean, and obviously you're very passionate about how you feel and, you know, and then also talking about you being misdiagnosed and diagnosed mm -hmm. and misdiagnosed. Does all of that, everything we just talked about right there, does that all lend to how you decide to, I mean, to, to song writing, to like well, some of the songs you write? Does it, do, do, do you have a song that completely encompasses any of that or all of it or just little bits and pieces of that? Songwriting is a reflection of where you're at, you know, uh, emotionally and stuff. And, um, it's, uh, it's where you're at intellectually, you know, the more language command you have or the more vocabulary you have or the older you get, the better you should be, you know, right. of expressing yourself, right? So my question to you, uh, being that this episode of Down the Highway is about Los Angeles, do you think there's a Los Angeles sound musically? Yes. Um, the, the Los Angeles sound musically is almost, strangely enough, a mirror of the architecture of Los Angeles. Ooh. Which is there was the this fantastic, beautiful architecture from the you know 1800s. Let's say we'll go back to that, and there was a rich musical history here. You know there was you know the Mexican music here and stuff, and the people that were here first. Um, and then of course you know you had you know the 60s music. Let's just pick another one mm -hmm. that was here. 
but like the architecture here, it's it's a it's a pastiche of these like there'll be like a, a Spanish style bungalow mm -hmm. next to a kind of Tudor house next to something from the 20s that looks like a spaceship and yeah. that's the way los angeles was built sure and that's the what has happened over the years is all the great stuff's been torn down and replaced with horrible l-shaped shopping centers and apartment buildings and parking lots and it's kind of destroyed uh, the musical history has been destroyed as well like what i was saying about the punk scene nobody knows about all these bands and what that was about it celebrate it like it was a national treasure you know and it should be but um so it, it to me it, to me it feels like that it's like it's temporary in a way it's destructible but it's beautiful it's it's classic it gives the world some of its most beautiful images the brown derby restaurant sure. you know but it's gone yeah. you know the ambassador hotel let's kill robert kennedy but it's gone do you, you think know? music has left with those well i think it does come and go like that here that's why yeah. i don't think it has a sound per se like um the la sound you know i mean you have the beach boys and you have the doors yeah, which of course are, I mean, that is LA. And who's I mean, scarier, Brian Wilson or Jim Morrison? That's, I would probably say but, Brian Wilson, but anyways. But anyway, <laughs> but, yeah. um, so, you know, it is, it's it's like it's like everybody for themselves. It's like um, Day of the Locust, you know, it's like everybody comes here with a dream and they want to fulfill that dream and along the way their dream gets destroyed and they get destroyed. Or they survive and they just climb, claw their way to the top. But there's always that underbelly of the Charles Bukowski, John Fante, X germs, plugs, weirdos, you know, Sunset Strip, you know, underground music now and the 20s music that's jazz that's being played sure. by a lot of young people now that will resurface, you know. And, and, you know, you just try to keep propping it up. You try to keep propping up the music scene, propping up your town, you know, saving what you can save, yeah. preserving what you can preserve and... and and making it nice, you know. Sprawl of, of the Los Angeles area and Orange County, which is connected to it, was um, responsible for some of the factionalism during the punk days of the original Hollywood scene and the hardcore scene from the South Bay. And it also makes it so that it's isolated. You have a West Side scene that's totally different from a Echo Park scene. Yeah. You know, so it's like... Yeah, two miles, to get, three miles away. Try to get a band to come down to play Orange County. Well, what's happening is now everybody's doing that. And I, I'm seeing that a lot is everybody's traveling around to different towns and they're playing a lot. So it's like people are playing in Long Beach one night and the Redwood in downtown the next night, then my place down in Orange and then all the way in the Valley. And they're just, everybody's just moving around and trying to... You know, and it's not just for money because you're not making any money. It's to play music. Yeah, no, it, and and I, I find that that part of Los Angeles very interesting, and it, I think it's really I never thought of it the way you think of it, the way that the music can actually tie in with the architecture. Well, you want to play a song, one of your oh, new songs? Right. Oh my goodness, I forgot all about that part. All right, let's take a break and do that. All right, cool. I'm going to introduce the song. It's called Already in Love, and it's from my record, um, The Excitement of Maybe, the love songs record I told you about. All right. All right, here we go. It's late it always is, girl groups and drugs. It's only a Tuesday night, but I'm already in But I'm a 